Next bunch of classes, I am going to be covering this first, second, third chapter, making at least three passes through here. We've already made one. Um, because I feel that to get, to truly get the information after chapter three on, it's really important to, to um, be standing firmly on the foundation that Paul sets in the first three chapters. And um, <clears throat> so last class we began with verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. Now we talked a little bit about that, and really what we did last class was I invited um, <clears throat> choir members to speak up and uh, to share, to sing forth the praises of God, and they did heartily. Um, and we, we did discuss this, but I'd like to just go over it again, but maybe just to add a few little things this time around. Uh, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And um, there is this thought that, um, uh, that this is addressing people who you come up to and you witness to and you say, you need Jesus, and they say, no, I'm not ready, or whatever, any, any number of things. <clears throat> but rather, this is people who end up perishing in their stand because, uh, and, and let me make sure that you understand that here the preaching of the cross is not just that Jesus died to save you from your sins. This is speaking absolutely, positively about the foolishness that the way God would go, God, God, almighty deity, almighty God, that the way he would go about saving the world and functioning to bring us into life and freedom would be that he would go hang on a cross. Out of all the ways that God could proceed, out of all the power that he's got, why would God let people, wicked people, take control of his life and nail him to a cross and kill him and then some idiot fishermen and some others point to that and say there is the salvation of the world and they look at that and they go that's just dumb you got to remember the times you've got the roman world and the greek world are very prevalent at that, at that time and and in the roman world they were going around conquering nation after nation and they they had it down as far as how to uh battle and the war against all sorts of tr uh, tribes and heathen and nations and countries. And basically they were ruling the world because they knew how to use force and power to get to subject people to them. <clears throat> all right. And <clears throat> if you weren't of Roman origin and hadn't become a Roman citizen by paying off the Romans, <clears throat> then you were subjected in some way or another and paying tribute, okay? You, you were um, <clears throat> forced to pay tribute and anything you earned, a big portion of that went to the Roman Empire. And if you didn't follow up, then they would follow up with force again. All right. And of course, the Greeks, they had all sorts of philosophies. Uh, also mixed in with that were the Greek gods and their explanation of how gods operate and that gods are always fighting and using their powers and that some have this power and some have the power of the sea and some have, you know, I mean, uh, who's the guy in power of the sea? I can't even think of his name. Poseidon, uh, Poseidon, and, and uh, uh, you know, different ones with different 
things. And so you, you see, you know, one of the main things you see is them fighting with each other. <laughs> and what are they usually fighting over? Power, position, prestige, property, something, something. All right. So this was the well understood way of the gods. And so here they're presenting this God came down and he became a carpenter's son. I mean, he wasn't even a full-fledged carpenter. He didn't even get his license. <laughs> and he's, he's just a journeyman or uh, whatever. And, and so he decides he's going to die on a cross and save the world. And the wisdom of that is foolishness to them. The wisdom of that is absolutely foolishness to them. Okay. All right. So, preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto we that are saved it is the power of God. And this power of God, this phrase, the power of God, is not saying that it is, um, it is the, um, through that cross, we have power in the sense of, well, he died so we'd be rich. Well, he died so we'd have power. So he, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's not all that mo most, much of Christianity certainly applies to this scripture, but rather it is the power of God in that life comes out of death. And if God's going to really do what he does, he's going to do it through death. Now, this is the premise that Paul is setting to these Corinthians. This is a huge contrast to these Corinthians, and he's going to really deal with this all the way through. And so much so that what you're going to find is that he basically is breaking down their theology and reestablishing, because he's the one who raised this church up, but they'd let some others in, and it wasn't all Judaizers. I mean, I, I sort of get the feeling that maybe Apollos and some of these others were teaching some things that were, you know, and that's why some were more of them, you know. I mean, Paul's message wasn't very exciting. You know, death? You know, life comes out of death? You know, or, you know, well, let's say life comes out of death. Life comes out of his death. He dies, and we do the living. There, I like that gospel. But as we shall see, that's not the gospel that Paul preached. That's not what he was at, at when he was preaching this. All right. So um, I wrote on the board this uh, little chart. I'm sure, I'm sure that camera is accurate to two-fourths of a point of, of font. And I did write this in a special font. It's called the Randissimo font. <laughs> All right. So listen, we've got, we're missing the on the arrow right here. And that is the wisdom of man, when they look at the cross, this says the wisdom of man here. Okay. <laughs> the wisdom of man views the cross as foolish and weak. Okay? Foolish and weak. You could almost say ridiculous. That is why, I mean, this is the weakness of God. I mean, this is what he talks about down here. Maybe at this point it would be good to just read a few more scriptures so that we're all on the same page. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this age? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And God is destroying their wisdom of might makes right and of power and of, of, of force and of all of this, but only in the minds of those who become born again and actually receive the 
power of God. They're the ones, because all the, the Romans and all them, they continued for years and years and years after this. They weren't, you know, ultimately uh, brought down by the wisdom of God. They were brought down by their own garbage, you know. We won't get into all that, but, you know. And so for those who receive this wisdom of God, and here it is, the wisdom of God sees the cross as wisdom and power. So let's, let's read on. Verse 21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. What do we preach? I got that in stereo through only two speakers. Okay, Christ crucified. Thank you. Um, for we preach, but but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Gentiles foolishness. But unto them who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. All right, so here it is. This cross is the, is the foolishness of God. What, we, what they're calling foolishness. But yet God in his very foolishness as they see it, and God in his total weakness is wiser and stronger than men. Okay. There was something, let's see, let me just make sure. Because I read something and something caught my eye after that. And the wisdom of God of the world. After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. That force, that power, that overcoming your enemies, that mistreating them or, or getting back at them, and that, that wisdom will never, ever lead to knowing God. That's what it's saying here. You can't know God through that. You can't know God through that wisdom. You can know how, you can study up, and you can strategize, and you can learn how to crush your enemy, but you'll never know God, because God's not in that wisdom, okay? But in this wisdom, the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of God, you begin to understand God, who God is by what they term the foolishness of God. The foolishness of God disrobing himself of his deity and stepping down and becoming a man. And then not just a man, but comes in the form of a servant, a um, willing slave, willing slavery, choosing it. And from that, stepping down further to die for us to bring all this about, and then choosing the worst, the worst possible death, and the death that would identify the person who died on it as the worst of criminals, not just a criminal, folks. The worst of criminals died on a cross. You know, you, do, you, do you realize that if you were actually a, a pretty good criminal, you'd get your head cut off? Quick and easy. You know, <laughs> you might even still have a smile on your face. But on the cross, you're losing your breath, you're losing everything, they're beating you, they're, and they're mocking you. And you're just hanging there and you can't do anything about it. Your hands are nailed, your feet are nailed. It is foolishness to those who 
want to conquer the world, to those who want to conquer the business world, to those who want to become, you know, uh, you know, I've said it before, you know, it's, uh, it's the Braveheart syndrome. Oh, boils the blood of the men to watch that. Yeah, you know, riding back and forth on it. Yeah, do it, ah, you know, and then screaming into the fray. If you remember the movie, it was pretty bloody as people hacked each other to death. You know. Now that's not foolish. <laughs> no, that, that's smart. <laughs> as long as you're the leader in the back telling them to go fight, that's pretty smart. You know. But for Jesus to take all the blame, knowing that he could call 10,000 angels, it's one thing to be made totally helpless. But folks, the weakness of God wasn't that somebody made him helpless. The weakness was of God was that he, he allowed himself to be taken. He allowed every slide, every every. Thing, when they put the crown of thorns on his head, when they put a robe on him and slapped him and mocked him and all that, every moment of everything that happened to him, he allowed and could have stopped it at any given moment. Do you understand that? Okay, well, that's great for Jesus, but if this should ever apply to you, you know, and, and again, I'm, you know, here's my disclaimer, and I'll be making this one a lot. You might want to write it down. Sometimes it'll be better than others as I give it, but. My disclaimer is, you know, I don't put this, this cross on you. I don't put this wisdom of God on you. I put it on me so that should you ever decide to turn and want to attack me, this is the way I will act. But you don't have to, okay? Nobody here ever that listens to this has to. Paul's not even talking to you if you want to really take it that way. He's talking to the Corinthians and... Doggone it, he's talking to me. But, you know, I'm telling you, I, don't, I am not in my heart putting this on anybody. I preach it because I, God's called me to do it. But when it comes to living it, I'm the only one responsible in this room to do it. And I will, I will promise you that as much as the Lord in me is, I will. So that's usually good news for bullies. So somebody understood that because the bully really likes to do it when the person doesn't fight back. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, this is so foolish. Why would I want to suggest this for anybody else anyway? So, all right. But we do see at least how, how great this is for Jesus. Can we not see how great that is for Jesus that he went this way? And that he, at every moment, with anything that happened, no matter how hard it got or how mean it got, he was a willing slave at the hands of those who were his master at that moment because he chose to be a willing sacrifice, not to be murdered. That was his choice, okay? And to him, he functioned by what he considered the wisdom of God. Not only that, but this is telling us that by this wisdom, you can actually know what God is like. And guess what? No matter how much people embrace that other wisdom, they'll never know God, even when they think they know God. Okay, you get that? They'll never know God. Even when they think they know God, they don't know God. You can't. You can't possibly know God. You have to know God by the wisdom of God. <clears throat> anyway, all right. So, um, and then down at the bottom, I put a little chart, and I don't know if that one could be seen as well, but it's, uh, it says how each views each other's wisdom. You have man and God. And this is how each other views each other's wisdom, 
Okay? Man looks at God and his wisdom and thinks it's foolish. But God, looking through his wisdom at man, thinks man's foolish. He knows this. Oh, boy. I just, I like this pink and black together. It's very 80s. I kind of miss the 80s. I didn't, I, I wasn't really there for it. <laughs> All right. So let me read a few statements here. Uh, 1 Corinthians does not give us a theological examination of the cross of Christ, but stays away from the event and the surrounding doctrinal points. He leaves all that and spends a whole book presenting the cross as the wisdom that is opposed to how others think, but results in a sacrificial lifestyle benefiting others to its own loss. It is about how we treat others based on what wisdom we possess. Now, we all, we all treat one another. <laughs> or at least the word treats in the scheme. It may have a miss in front of it. But we all, you know, we all treat one another. And trust me, we all do that based on a certain wisdom. Now, now let me show you what I mean. For example, you could be really mean to somebody because you don't like them. But you could be really nice to somebody, not necessarily because you don't like them. In fact, they may have the same traits as the person you don't like. But if they have position or they have something that can benefit you, something you want, you may treat them nice, even though they're exactly like that person over there, but they have something. And so, so it looks... To some people, it, that could look deceptive because in one place you're mistreating, but in another place you're really honoring and blessing someone. But all of it's motivated for self, okay? To promote self, to satisfy self in some way. And so um, we may not, we may not even, I mean, we can hear these classes, let's face it. We can hear these classes and we can talk about it. But when we walk out of the room, there's already a wisdom that has control of us. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's already a wisdom that has control of us. And uh, while we might, you know, I think that a lot of times most people are better in church than they are at home. Now that's just, I'm probably wrong about that. <laughs> but people, people can see you a certain way at church and think that you're a certain way. You go, that person's so nice. They're so caring, you know. And, you know, the best, if they're married, the best thing to do is ask their spouse. I've had people do that. <laughs> I remember, do we have Doug Fisher on the line? Probably not. I remember when I first met Doug, and, and, uh, and I went to Costa Rica several times before, but Deb didn't go with me. But finally came a time where she came, and he grabbed her and pulled her aside, and he says, okay, what's he really like? Well, she's the wrong one to ask. <laughs> She's so snowed, she thinks I'm really something. But anyway, that's... <laughs> <laughs> um, but but there, is a, there is a wisdom that is already basically controlling us, and we can, um, we can do things from time to time that are not congruent with that wisdom, like... Um, walk past the uh, Salvation Army bucket ringer person and go and go put $20 in there, you know, and feel really good about ourselves and go, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, go home and, you know, you know, I won't even, I, I won't even describe it, but you know. <laughs> but we do have it on videotape. If anybody would like to. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and 
So my point of that is, is that, you know, even many times, I mean, if we hear a sermon, we might go do something good. But even many times, for example, if we put money in that bucket or whatever, um, we're doing it to feel better about ourselves. Well, I've been going through a rough time and I want to feel good about myself, you know. And uh, I, uh, I uh, remember, uh, I remember some teenagers that we had in our church and, and they said uh, the offering was coming and one of them said to his parents, oh, give me, mama, give me five dollars. And uh, so the mom gave him five dollars and afterwards he came up to me and said, I put five dollars in the offering. I said, well, if you were at the mall, how much money would you have asked for? It wouldn't have been five dollars. You know, I want that eighty dollar pair of jeans, or now they can be way above that, you know what I mean? And but we think we really did something in that offering or something. I'm just using that as an example. We don't even know what we're made up of. Yes. And I don't think any of us do. I'm not I'm not acting like I do. I'm telling you that there's only one answer. And that answer is that the wisdom of God has to destroy the wisdom of the wise so that you're no longer wise. And it says that on over in the third chapter. It gets into that, and, you know. But it, it, it literally, so he says, so, so that you might become a fool. That's what he says over in the third chapter. Meaning, you know. You have the wisdom of God. You understand that this weakness, that this foolishness is actually wisdom and power. You understand that, see? And it destroys that other so that you're no longer functioning by that. But you can't unlearn the wisdom of this world or the wisdom of man. You can't unlearn it. You can't, you can't just stop. You don't just stop. You don't just go, okay. I'm going to add this to the three other steps that I've had, and probably in 25 years I'll be okay. It doesn't work that way. It's, there has to be a crashing wisdom that totally tears away our preconceived ideas of what, uh, the way God was or the way we were supposed to do something or whatever, and God has to reveal his own wisdom to you, which comes at the cross. Okay. Because the wisdom and the power of God is Christ crucified. We read it right here. The wisdom and the power of God is Christ crucified. It's not Christ, and it's not the cross. And Paul says the cross, he did in verse 18, but he goes on to show he's talking about Christ crucified. He's talking about this self-giving way. He's not just talking about, um, uh, and again, he feels that the cross, and I believe all of the first century people did, they feel that, the, that Christ crucified is the pinnacle of understanding God and that God chose that to be the thing that stands between heaven and earth, the thing that is from time past and time. That's the focal point of everything right there. And they, they believe it. That's why Paul, you don't hear him talking hardly all about anything else Jesus did. And you don't hear the rest of them doing that much. It's the cross. They talk about the cross. Because God showed them that that right there, that's the wisdom of God. That's knowing God. That, if you want to know God, you look there. You don't, you know. Even, folks, even to see Jesus feeding the multitudes or healing somebody or whatever, that's not the pinnacle. And I know churches are built on that. We are the holy temple of the faith for healing you know, Baptists. You know. <laughs> I didn't say they were real Orthodox. I just said that they're... <clears throat> but that's, you know, I mean, that's just, you know. And so we raise up that banner. But folks, there is no banner but Christ crucified. 
That is the banner of God. And I'm, I'm telling you that, but I'm not telling you to believe it. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> you say, well, aren't you the pastor and supposed to tell us to believe it? You know, no, no, in a sense, if I'm walking that way and you're following, good. But you don't hear a lot about shepherds turning around going, okay, now, sheep, when we get to the river, I want you to, you know, so we follow Jesus because he's the good shepherd. And we find out what he means. And we compare what I'm saying to what Pastor Bill has said. And we find out for ourselves. And if we come to a different conclusion than what I'm saying, good, fine. God's made us, given us free will. You can believe anything. There are a lot of really weird ones out there that might even be much more fun. In fact, I don't know that, any, that there's any of them less fun. Except, <laughs> you know, except that it is the wisdom and it is the power of God. And there's no, you see, the, here's the funny thing. There's no one that got saved that didn't believe in it at least Referring to Jesus. <laughs> you getting that? And a person, that's, if they truly believe, that's what they believe. That he was God and he came down and he gave up and he, you know, and he, he became weak and he did all that. So there's, there's you know, you're without excuse beyond that. Because that is the salvation. But, but this wisdom is inviting us to step in and see beyond the salvation at the cross to see the true spirit and nature of God. Okay, sticking with Corinthians. To see the, the true wisdom of God in the cross. To see that that's power as far as God's concerned. That is his power. It's not just a power, it's his power. All right, so let's see. Um, 1 Corinthians describes what men term as foolishness and weakness of God. He, descri he describes as he is described as the wisdom and the power of God. Christ crucified is. The foolishness and weakness of God as seen in the incarnate man being crucified is the picture of the wisdom and power of God. You want to hear it again? The foolishness and weakness of God as seen in the incarnate man being crucified is capital I, capital S, is the wisdom and power of God. He doesn't bring wisdom and power out of that. That is a demonstration of how he thinks and how he proceeds. <clears throat> All right, it is Christ crucified. So we must start with the weakness and foolishness of God. The only way to grasp the wis wisdom and power of God is to see God's wisdom and power behind foolishness and weakness. In other words, we must comprehend Christ crucified. Uh, so, we say, you know, Lord, this person is, just hates me and they're always picking on me. Give me wisdom how to deal with this. Well, he's probably thinking, well, which kind of wisdom are you really looking for? Yeah. But we, and I'm just, I'm just trying to make a point here. But do we really understand the wisdom of God when we ask for wisdom? <laughs> okay. We've got at least two no's. Because who knows? <laughs> and so... Um, Without that, then we, you know, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally. Then if what we're saying is true, then we know scriptures, but we're like little parrots going, ah, give me wisdom, give me wisdom. We don't know that. Remember what I said? You know, don't ask if something's true first. Ask what he really means. Because if in your mind you formulated what it means and that's not what he's saying, it doesn't do any good to ask if it's true. 
So you, you find yourself regularly just going, hold up, I don't, I don't even think I know, you know, because by our wisdom, we think, well, he says something, we go, oh, I got that. The disciples did it all the time, didn't they? <laughs> you know, uh, can you drink the cup? Yeah, we drink. And they go, sure, especially me and, me and John here. Yeah. Sons of Zebedee always can drink the cup. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus goes, oh, baby, you will. <laughs> you will. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but at that moment, they didn't have any clue, and therefore anything Jesus said, they formulated according to their understanding and according to their wisdom. You see that? Because you can have an understanding of something and totally perverted by the wisdom of this world, by the wisdom of man. Because you... The approach that you take with that understanding or with that knowledge is going to be opposite Christ crucified. Yes, and speak up loudly. Just a thought, Andy. Very short. Is that we are held captive by our own wisdom. Well, we are. However, we think that we're wise. We, yeah, and free, yeah. And we think that we actually came up with this yeah. stuff. You know. <laughs> Well, I know what to do. I'll just run over them with my car. You know? <laughs> That'll be the end of it. Maybe I can get insurance money for the wreck. <laughs> get rid of them. Get some money. This is God. You see it all the time on 48 Hours, whatever the show is. You know? <laughs> you know, they, they think through it. They go, well, I, I know this will work. I'll just kill them. <clears throat> <laughs> and then they spend the rest of their life behind bars in prison being abused by other people who think the way they did. <clears throat> Some of you are looking at me like, is that where I'm going to end up? No. <laughs> I mean, I could just, I saw some flashing going on. I, I, no, we're just talking right now, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they go, I don't like his teaching them. We got to kill him. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, the weakness of God. The weakness of God. That is putting himself in a place of vulnerability to hum humanity and not using his deity to stop it. He became, and I don't like using this word, but I, it'll at least point you in the right direction. He became passive in terms of his use of supreme power as the Almighty. Okay, well, um, I have to be careful because the Lord is sharing with me, been sharing with me now, apparently will be sharing with me for years to come on some of these things. Uh, I don't want to cross any lines with him because I'm the student, you know what I mean? And I don't want to act like the teacher when I'm, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about yet, so I'm not going to say that part. <clears throat> All right, so we mentioned this, finding God's essence at the cross. So I'm just going to read this. The cross is the story of God, the story of who he really is. Because it says, the world by wisdom knew not God. But it also says, uh, well, it says for after that, in the wisdom of God, uh, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Because they don't know God until they receive the message of the truth and the truth makes them free. It's first following him in his way, then learning his truth until it becomes life. He is the way, the truth, and ultimately the life of the whole thing. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so the cross is the story of God, the story of who he really is. The incarnated one is no longer 
the, the incarnated one, capital one, Jesus, the incarnated one is no longer here. And the event of the cross is over. What remains is that picture of the cross and what the reality it displays. As such, it stands as the eternal focal point to arrive at and study if we are ever to really know God above that of just being deity. Now that was worded that way because of some things the Lord has been sharing with me over the last year. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't say anything. I want to, but I shouldn't. Um, and it is not the events and historical happenings surrounding the crucifixion that we are referring unto. We have placed the events of that day above what was manifested of God in those events. We've put the events of the cross. I mean, Easter is a celebration of the events. You know, if he, if he said in the Bible, well, commemorate the cross, you understand what I'm saying? Com or if he said this, what if he said this? Commemorate every year Christ crucified, then we would talk about the events. <laughs> we would talk about um, all of the things that happen, you know, well, they're gambling. Can you believe it? They're gambling at the foot of the cross. Well, can you believe God is being manifested in his greatest glory? Uh, um, um, John 12, 23, when he's about to talk about accept a seed fall into the ground, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now you're going to see the true expression and didn't it say Jesus was the express image and the substance of his person folks that was fully manifest at the cross so you know we talk about the cross but we're really talking about the events of the cross we talk about Christ crucified but we're really talking about what they did to him when he hung there the fact of hanging, hanging him there and what they did to him and what they said to him. But you, you can't really know God until you have sort of at least, I mean, apart from the Holy Spirit revealing it to you, you're never going to really understand what it means to be slapped and have all power to just wipe them out and literally not do it because of love, which is not sloppy, gooey hugging. It is selfless giving to the benefit of someone else. That's what love is, and that's what the cross. By this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You see? That, you know, don't get into something, don't get into eros, you know, man's love. Don't get into comprehension of that, trying to apply that to God. He is so selfless to the benefit of those that he is expressing that to, that love. All right. So, uh, we have placed the events of the day above what was manifested of God in those events. The events above the manifestation of God. Have we seen God there or have we only said, well, Jesus was God, so God was there, so I saw God there. That's not the same thing. Was that too fast? I mean, that's, you know, we know Jesus is God, so we see him hanging up there. You know, I mean, if you... If you've ever been to a Catholic church, you see this crucifix and he's bleeding and he's, you know, and you go, there's God. God is there. But in truth, you haven't seen God, what God is, because God is not flesh. He was manifested in the flesh. Did we see the one God is manifested in that flesh or did we see that flesh and call him God? I don't know. 
you might just think this is all semantics, and I don't think anybody necessarily here does, but it's, you know, some people could. This is all just semantic. No, it's not. It is the difference between God and our perception of God. It is the difference between an event and a true, full-blown, focal, eternal focal point of the manifestation of his essence in the wisdom of God and the power of God. Well, let's face it, that could be foolishness to somebody. <laughs> you know, people could listen to me right now, later on listen to this, or some of those people I can't really see, but they see me. And they could be nudging one another going, that guy's an idiot. I hear you, Matt. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and, and uh, because, God, because the word of God has already informed us, this does not make sense to the natural man. Christ crucified seems utterly foolish. How do you ever expect to get anywhere being that way? Well, let me tell you, I don't expect. I only expect it of me. But let's see. Uh, let's see, you know, who, who thought it not a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with deity, humbled himself, became as a man, became as a servant, humbled himself further to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, whether it be things in heaven or on earth or under the earth, and shall declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ah, what just got exalted? What was so big that it got exalted that high? Verse 5 through 8. That's what it was. Philippians 2 is what, what I was quoting. That's what it is. But there's a, there's a hitch. There's a hitch. You can't exalt yourself. You can't pull the spikes out of your hand and jab them in the eyes of your enemy. <laughs> you can't, you, you can't uh, call 10,000 angels. You can't you have to trust God. That God really treasures this. You following? That God really does treasure this. And boy, we'll find out who believes, won't we? I mean, you do. You do. I, you know, I'm just saying. You find you. You know, long before this generation, God found out who believed before, because. You know, have you ever noticed in like in, in the Psalms or whatever, the, the scriptures are always saying, wait patiently upon the Lord. Well, in our fast food society today, we don't wait patiently for anything. You know, I mean, they know exactly the point when we will start getting fiz fidgety if a light stays red too long. Did you know that? They do. And you can tell because everybody looks pulled up tight at a light, and if it's going just a little longer than what the, another one will, cars will start moving up, and get, they're going, well, well, come on, you know, we need to, it's time to, because it's all, it's all timed out, you know. <clears throat> but in this, it's, this stuff, you know, anybody ever noticed in Hebrews where it talked about in de Jesus with st strong crying and tears, trusting that God would raise him from the dead? Because you can't raise yourself. You know what I mean? If you're on a cross, you can't get down. See? And the bad thing is, see, one reason why this is foolishness is most people would not want to get on a cross because it, their hands are 
fixed and their feet are, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like you're hanging on a cross and they got one foot nailed and the guy's fixing to nail the other, you're <laughs> kicking him in the face, you know what I mean? And get your hand loose and slap him up, hey! You know? But you're, you're nailed up there and there ain't no way that you're gonna come down from there until you're dead and then you can't slap anybody at all. Believing that God would raise him from the dead. Same thing with Abraham. Willing to offer up his son, believing God would raise him from the dead. There has to be faith. And that's what faith is. Faith that life comes out of death. That is what faith is. And uh, I, you know, I went through it in Hebrews and I've, you know, but I'm telling you, I keep seeing it everywhere. Um, Shouldn't say that one just, just because it's, I'm not finished chewing on it. I don't want to be spitting out the seeds to you. I want to give you something to, but, but I'm telling you that this faith thing really, really, really comes down to believing in life out of death. And it takes, patience has to be connected with faith. And you find that all the time in the scriptures. Faith is connected with faith. You see it all the time. <clears throat> anyway. All right, so how much time we got back there? Nine minutes. All right. All right, I'm going to reread one sentence and then go into the next. Let's see. We, we have placed the events of that day above what was manifested of God in those events. We may be able to see in that event a love that brought Jesus to die for our sins and is for our benefit, but never really see what crucified love is in its essence. We can see that he died for our sins, and we see that love, he died for my sins. But that's not seeing that love in its essence, that's seeing what that love produced, and therefore loving him because of what I got out of it. <laughs> everybody still having fun all right we see what the event brought about for us but miss the eternal nature of what is before our eyes when we behold the event the eternal nature don't see it we just see it. praise God look I got healing what else? I got salvation I'm not going to hell you know I love you, Jesus. It is, uh, do we see that there is a self-giving love that is higher than maintaining deity? It is selfless to the degree that it moves God to empty himself of his place in the Godhead and set it aside a being of deity made of absolute perfection and purity was willing to become marked as vile and impure by those he seeks to save. He does not just die, but is humiliated and brutalized by his enemies. But this would be impossible as for God. His humiliation came because he humbled himself and became as a man in a form where they could strike back. He limited himself. So anyway, the measure of this deity, this God that we serve is, is only ever, you know, going to be comprehended at the cross. So I'll just close with this and that is, um, Before creation, there was no way for us to know God. At creation, all the way up through, we really could only see glimpses of what God represented through sacrifices, and that was huge. That was the way, sacrifice was the way God's people worshiped God. That was their worship, folks. 
I can show you a million examples. Even Abraham going up to offer Isaac. When he asked, where are we going? We're going up to worship. Sacrifice was the way. But you still don't see God. You only see an example of God. So Jesus comes and he heals and he does all that. None of that the fullest example because if he was a lamb before the foundation of the world and it, when the thing's all over, he's a lamb on the throne, that means before time and after time we get a picture of lamb. You understand what I'm saying? So he needed a circumstance to really show the depth of his essence. The essence of lamb. Can anybody think of a point in time that might be able to be shown fully? The cross. It's the first chance he got to really show how selfless he is, how self-giving, and the true nature of love being understood as crucified love. All right. Let's take a break. We'll come back shortly. I do have.